I got the bipolar, which was way louder um, than the ADHD, got that under control. And then the ADHD symptoms kind of start to emerge and reveal themselves. So for somebody with ADHD who thinks that they might have a bipolar illness, I would say, once again, not a clinician, and this is like totally a hypothesis, but I would imagine that, you know, an ADHD person without um, a comorbid diagnosis does have those um like, you know, hyper focus, maybe days or, or weeks where they're really like buzzing and have a lot of things going on and whatever. But I would say that like, you know, hypomania looks very different than that. We already talked about the physical thing, like a lack of a need for eating or sleeping or whatever, but also beyond just like being really excited about things and maybe like, um, I don't know, developing a new this or that, or I don't know what all the things people you know, deal with, with ADHD in terms of like productivity, right? High productivity. We go through phases of that, right? Hypomania is more than high productivity. It's like knowing that you could do it all. Your energy and productivity crosses a line into delusion, I would say. Um, Those might be symptoms of a bipolar disorder. ADHD Rewired episode 361. This is the podcast for those of us with really good intentions and a slightly wandering attention. I'm Eric Tivers. I'm a licensed clinical social worker by training and a coach by design. I'm your host and I have ADHD. ADHD Rewired is more than just a podcast. We are a community. We are wired for connection and you are not alone. Go to ADHDrewired.com to learn how you can join us in our free secret Facebook group. Get additional resources for every episode, including links to any resources we we mentioned on today's show. You can support us on Patreon, sign up for our email newsletter, you can request podcast postcards to distribute to your clients and support groups, and you can learn all about our intensive online video-based coaching and accountability groups. You can do all of this at our website, ADHDrewired.com. We know that starting is the hardest part, so let's get started. Welcome back to another episode of ADHD Rewired. Today's guest is Malika Tolford. Malika has been living in St. Louis for nearly a decade. She's a ceramic artist and owner of Place Value Pottery. She also teaches at a nonprofit craft organization. She was diagnosed with bipolar 2 disorder in 2013 and added an ADHD diagnosis in January of 2020, which provided some missing pieces to her mental health puzzle. She's also a mom trying to navigate COVID and raising two boys and doing all the working from home stuff that we're all doing while trying to uh, keep out of the way of her husband and keep them out of the way of her husband, who's also doing Zoom meetings and pivoting her business to, uh, I would imagine, to be more online. So, um, Malika, welcome to the podcast. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. So just to start off, so, you know, we typically, we try to go about 45 minutes here on the podcast. And uh, uh, before we hit record, we were trying to troubleshoot some audio issues. And we found that we were getting a buzzing when uh, when Malika's laptop was plugged in. So we uh, we have unplugged, we removed the buzzing, but then that also means we are, <laughs> we're at a race against power. A race against power, race against time. Yeah. Which is, you know, it's just a day with ADHD. Yeah. A day with ADHD. It's 2020. I mean, these are the parameters we're working with. So you reached out to me uh, a little while back. Um, you had heard a one of the, the episodes that I did with uh, Dr. Roberto Olivardia. Um, and uh, I think that was part of why you wanted to reach out with the interview that I did with him around bipolar and ADHD. Yeah, exactly. Um, after my diagnosis in January, um, I started, you know, trying to find out more about this comorbidity and there's not really that much out there. Um, when the pandemic started, that's when I got into podcasts. So then, um, you know, I was looking around through different ADHD podcasts and, um, found yours, found several, but, um, trying to like search for ones that have that overlap. And when I found your interview with Dr. Olivardia, it was like, oh my gosh, so many things came together. So many things clicked. And I don't think that I had felt seen like that. 
Um, plus you two have such a great like candor together. So it's really conversational and fun to listen to. Um, and I had also come across his name, you know, in a few articles out there as well. So then hearing him on your podcast was so cool. So yeah. Um, and I guess after that, I'm like, well, I can't be the only person who's dealing with this comorbid diagnosis. And like you guys said, it's fairly common. I mean, I think 20 percent of people with a bipolar disorder also have ADHD, most likely. So um, I thought, well, I don't know if I could share my story, then maybe someone out there would be like, ah, yes, this makes sense. And this clicks. So were, were there certain things that that I uh, remembered really resonating uh, with you? They're like, ah, oh, that makes so much sense. Well, um, one thing he talked about was, um, I mean, lots of things, but one of them was this um, almost kind of an identity thing where if you identify so much with your diagnosis with one thing, then you get another diagnosis and you have this like weird, um, I don't know, not identity crisis, but then you're like, oh, wait, do I really have this? Is it this? Maybe it was just this. And maybe I'm just, you know, you know, all of those kinds of questions, Um that arise. So that was really um, helpful to hear about how, especially through case studies that he presented, um, how people reconciled with that was really interesting. Um, and also just separating the two diagnoses in terms of like my own behavior and being able to see, um, okay, well, yeah, if you take away the bipolar, what are things that are just ADHD that you've noticed throughout your life, you know? Or if you were to take away the ADHD, maybe what would the bipolar have looked like without that? Um, and a lot of the things he talked about really helped me kind of, kind of separate those. I mean, overlap, but then separate them and kind of pick them apart. I know that you are, uh, your, your expertise in bipolar disorder is a personal experience, not a clinician. Um, of course. What is, you know, for, for listeners, uh, when they hear um, bipolar, and I think we mentioned bipolar 2, can you just explain for your understanding of what that means? Sure, as a non-clinician. Um, so uh, bipolar is usually now kind of considered a spectrum of different disorders. Um, you have bipolar one, you have bipolar two, there's bipolar, you know, not otherwise specified or things that don't fit into a certain category. And I think most of the public's understanding or the representation, I should say, in the media and stuff is usually an example of bipolar one, where you have like, you know, crazy extremes. I shouldn't say crazy, <laughs> I'm just using that disparagingly or descriptively. Um, but, you know, mania that is you know, very manic, uh, borderline psychotic, or oftentimes, you know, seeing symptoms of psychosis and then uh, depression on the other hand. And I think with bipolar one, those can kind of, uh, when people can have mixed states, and I don't know a lot about all of that because I have bipolar two, which I don't know, some people probably call it like bipolar light or something, but um, it's kind of marked by um, longer periods of depression. And then on the other end of things, instead of a manic, manic state, you get hypomania, which um, can be, I don't want to say just as disruptive, it's disruptive in a different kind of way. So I'm not like thinking I can climb buildings and that I might be Jesus or whatever, but I'm making a lot of impulsive decisions based on not a clear picture of what reality is. They just might not seem as extreme, which is also hard for other people around you to notice necessarily. Um, and also it was hard for me to really understand what that was for a long time. So now that I can look back, I would say there's definitely a clear, like, I want to say like four, maybe four or five years where I was definitely dealing with this and did not really know what it was because um, I think I only had my first like major depressive episode, maybe two years before my diagnosis. And then when you're depressed, well, you know, you can't really rationalize anything. And then when you're hypomanic, everything's awesome. So it's just like, life is great. Things are magical. I'm awesome. And this is not a problem. So what was it that, um, led you to seeking uh, um, an evaluation and to get that diagnosis for bipolar? Sure. Um, I kind of eventually after um, a deep depression and then coming out of that into a very 
dramatic kind of upswing, which uh, coincided with the death of a close family member. So that kind of, and I happened to be kind of coming out of a depressive episode at that point. And then that kind of trauma, I think, really triggered things. And I went into pretty extreme, like hypomanic episode where I'm like, this is not normal. This is not what I would expect to grieve. I mean, everyone grieves differently, but that's not what I would have expected. Um, and I was in a weird way because I was hypomanic. I was excited. I'm like, what if this is, this is bipolar? Maybe this makes sense. I mean, what have these depressions been and these other states like, um, and so I started research and researching and reading and stuff like that. And I was like, this is what this is. I'm going to find a counselor and we're going to talk about it. But because I was hypomanic, I wasn't going into it as like, a, this is a problem. It was more like, this is an exciting new facet of my personality that I'm here to explore. So, and at that point in my life, I was kind of thinking I could, I wasn't interested in medication. I was interested in finding tools to help me with the symptoms on both ends. So I didn't seek medication until three years ago. Mm, what, what was it uh, that, that changed or that or shifted in you? Um, what shifted then was I had kids and I had a three-year-old and a one-year-old and I went through a pretty major depressive episode over that particular spring to the point where, um, you know, I had to kind of figure out, okay, you know, these kids are going to benefit more from having their mom exist in the world than not. Um, so I was like, this, this has to, it's time to do something about this. Were, because, were you suicidal at the time? Yeah. It's so hard to, um, to say that, even though I've talked to my psychiatrist and counselors I heard, I heard about it. it but <laughs> I know it's hard, right? Cause when you're in it, it's very not well, because you don't feel anything. So, um, but yeah, um, I was, and I didn't have, you know, a plan or anything necessarily, but definitely those feelings of like, oh, I am a burden on everyone around me. My husband and my kids would be better off, you know, if I wasn't around. This sucks, you know, but there is that, I don't know, that little glimmer of like, but you you have been through this cycle before, you know, this is not going to be forever. You maybe have a month, month and a half left in here. Let's try to pull through this one and then we're going to take care of this. You know, I... I one perspective that I think is helpful uh, when, when people are dealing with uh, any any mental health uh, illness where suicidal uh, thoughts are, are present um, is really understand that our neurochemistry gets linked up with the language part of our brain. Oh right? yeah. So it's when we when those suicidal thoughts are present, that's just that's the language of an illness. Right. And yeah. it's, it's, it's what, it's what the illness speaks. And so I think when mm -hmm. we can recognize that, like, oh, like, because of, uh, this, you know, depressive episode, like the depressive episode is sort of, is, um, is, uh, causing me to have these kinds of thoughts versus, um, kind of over, uh, uh, identifying with those thoughts. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Or, for or sure. Like, I am suicidal versus, uh, like, this depressive episode is causing me to have suicidal thoughts. Exactly. Um, and I think one of the benefits of having had these cycles so many times over and over again, and not every depressive episode looks the same and not every hypomanic episode looks the same, but at least at that point I had, you know, the personal history of dealing with this. So I knew that this wasn't going to be forever. So I really feel for people dealing with a major depressive episode and more of a I don't know, what is it called? Unipolar, you know, mm -hmm. depression, um, not knowing what that's going to look like, not knowing when it's going to end uh, and not knowing how it's going to evolve. So I had that, like, I couldn't see the light at the end of the tunnel, but I knew that it was there, you know? Um, and so that was really helpful. Have you found your, uh, your cycles to be like fairly predictable or have you tracked the, the, in, the intervals between them? I have tracked the intervals between them um, because I am such a weirdo and um, really am interested in like personal history. And I have, well, they're not really journals, but I keep a lot of old notebooks, um, which have thoughts, but also mundane things like work schedule, you know, calendar, to -do, to do lists, lists whatever. <laughs> exactly. So um, looking back through those, it's like, yep, okay. I had 
a lot going on in these few weeks and then just trickled away from things. And um, so, yeah, my my cycles are typically like I'm going to say three to four months long. And so what that looks like for me is maybe I'd say at the lowest low, maybe about six weeks to at longest, maybe three months of depression. And then on the other end, um, like the serious hypomanic state, I mean, that heightened like up at the top peak is usually like even just like one week to, to three weeks. So and maybe, I don't know, a couple months in there were, were kind of at like an even keel. Um, but so I would say I would get like a hypomanic state. Yeah, like maybe two to three times a year. And same with depression, maybe two or three episodes a year. So you have this sort of cycling inconsistency related to the bipolar uh, disorder. Yeah. And then you have the ADHD inconsistency. You've, that's, you know... Uh, maybe a little bit more variable. Yeah. Yeah. Especially so how it fun. interplays. <laughs> I know so much fun. Um, ADHD can see a cycle between, you know, anxiety and depression. A lot of the things, the symptoms of the ADHD can lead to those kinds of things. So it's like, well, I wonder if any of my depressive episodes, were they like clockwork because of the bipolar or were there some things going on with the ADHD that may be triggered that depressive episode or maybe sped it up or maybe, you know, prolonged it. Um, so it's interesting to go back and look at how those may have, you know, interplayed. What I want to do is find out uh, more about like kind of the, the years leading up to the bipolar uh, diagnosis until you started medication, what the, uh, what it was like for you and start a medication for, for uh bipolar disorder and then what led to the ADHD uh, diagnosis. But what I want to do first yeah. is, is take a quick break. And when we come sure. back, we will uh, we will dive right into that. So we will be right back. Support for this podcast comes from the ADHD Rewired Coaching Community, which includes our intensive coaching and accountability groups and our alumni membership community. If you are new to the podcast, welcome to ADHD Rewired. We are glad that you are here. We are getting ready for the next season of coaching and accountability groups. Our registration and kickoff event will be Thursday, February 25th at 1130 a.m. Pacific, 230 p.m. Eastern. We emailed everyone on our 24th season interest list, our spring interest list, with details on completing the three steps for registration. So if you haven't added yourself to the interest list for our spring coaching groups yet, go to coachingrewire.com and click on the green button. We will get you all the information you need. Remember, registration is by invitation only. Listen to one of our coaching members from a few seasons ago. On the first day of class, Eric said, don't be attached to outcomes, be open to possibilities. And I decided that the best simile for this class would be like that giant closet you haven't cleaned out in a long time. And you take everything out of it and you like try on hats. And you go, what the hell was I thinking? This is a terrible hat on me. And you get rid of it. And then you find treasures that you're like, wait, why did I leave my pickle ball paddle in here I love pickleball or whatever but as you're cleaning out this closet you're like getting rid of stuff and cleaning up stuff and it's all jammed in there and stuck and then when you take your stuff to Jesus saves or goodwill or whatever you suddenly have this freedom and lightness in your life so I thought that was the closet it's a closet it's the perfect simile spring is on its way so start thinking about cleaning out that closet go to coachingrewire.com and click on the green button to add your name to our interest list the spring sessions start april 7th and go through june 18th registration is by invitation only so if you want to make sure you get invited follow the steps to register in the email. This is your chance to attend our invitation only registration event on February 25th. There are steps to follow and submit. So remember to schedule that time on your calendar. We know that starting is the hardest part, but starting starts at coachingrewired.com. 
That's coachingrewired.com. If you are a parent of a kid with ADHD, then you won't want to miss the upcoming ADHD Summit hosted by last week's guest, Adrian Harrison, the founder of smartcourses.io. I'm going to be one of the speakers there, and it was really fun to be able to talk about it. And it's really important to me. It's about self-awareness, self-advocacy, and self-determination. To get more info about the summit, which uh, the kickoff for it is on January 31st and ends February 5th, all sessions viewed live or for up to 24 hours after the event are free. And you can register by going to ADHDrewired.com slash smart summit. That's ADHDrewired.com slash smart summit. We have a few new adventures that we will be offering here at ADHD Rewired. One is our adult study hall, which will allow you to work together with other adults with ADHD on Zoom. We will be offering a growing schedule of structured and themed work sessions. We'll start you off with a couple of questions to help you define your work tasks, and you'll get to report back the end of your work session. We will also offer our adult study hall on demand, which is a Zoom room that will be open 24 hours a day that you can hop into to work with other peers with ADHD. Go to adultstudyhall.com and add your name to the list to get your chance at locking in our founder's rate of only $9.99 a month. That's half off of what our standard membership fee will be. We will be giving this rate to the first 100 members, our founders. So to get your chance to lock in the rates, go to adultstudyhall.com and add your name to that list. We will have more information in the weeks ahead. As always, when building something new, we never know exactly how long it's going to take. And not surprisingly, it's taking a little bit longer, but we continue to make progress on it. That's adultstudyhall.com. All right, we are back. And uh, I was just informed that uh, we're at 62% power. So we're on track here. Uh, I feel so bad for everyone who has like tech anxiety out there. Who's like, oh my God, what's she at now? Oh my gosh, is she at 50? Oh, I hope we're doing okay. She's closed all of her programs. Her screen is about as dark as she can get it. So I think we're okay. Oh my gosh. (laughs) All right. So um, you were diagnosed with bipolar 2 in 2013, started taking medication for bipolar in 2017. Mm-hmm. Um, can I ask what were you uh, prescribed? Um, I am on Lamictal. So the generic is Lamotrigine, okay. on 200 milligrams. Um, and I have to say, like, I lucked out in a serious way because A, I kind of figured out my diagnosis quickly. B, my psychiatrist is awesome really took a lot of time to listen to me and figure things out. And um, the first thing we tried worked. That is not the story with, I would say, 90% of bipolar illnesses, especially when they may have been misdiagnosed for many years. Um, I remember Dr. Olivardia giving those statistics about like on average, what, more than 10 years usually takes to get a correct diagnosis. Mm. And then maybe even a lifetime of playing around with medications to try to get the right recipe for your brain. Um, And so the... The medication has cut out um, the the lowest parts of depression. I still have, um, now it's more predictable. It's usually kind of an annual light depression. Um, And yeah, so it took some, it took away that, which is amazing. I mean, it's amazing to sit here and think like, wow, it has been now three years without a major depressive episode. I mean, that is fantastic and i i do think about that every day um so so yeah that was and you know hypomania i have to admit you know sometimes you miss it sometimes you miss feeling like the most magical amazing best version of yourself i miss the confidence there's just this heightened sense of euphoria of confidence Uh, of of almost thinking that you can do anything You can do anything and you can, you don't have to sleep. Um, You don't really have to eat very much. You're just driven by this. Which is different from like the ADHD, like, like when you think that you can like function on very little sleep or probably all night, like actually your body doesn't need the sleep. 
Yeah, like, yeah, exactly. Um, which uh, long term has, you know, devastating effects. Yeah. So when you create you, that's not sustainable. As it turns out, you do need to eat and sleep to function properly as a human being. So when you crash out of that, you know, it's it's really hard. So then the then the ADHD uh, gets diagnosed. What was going on that that led to that? So, um, okay. So you can picture me being on like a medication for three years or at that point, like two and a half years, feeling pretty even keel, not having to deal with these extremes, but still dealing with anxiety, dealing with struggling with a lot of different things that it's like, but now I have my mental illness under control. Why is it so hard to be a person and function as an adult? And there's such a culture of, I don't know, maybe it's a generational thing, but like uh, adulting is so hard, you know? And I'm like, yeah, but are other people having these issues? And I'll tell you that my issues were, you know, things like Time, now that I know that they have names, um, you know, like we think of time blindness and disorganization to an extreme um, and, you know, not being able to stay in one lane. And um, and I sometimes I think about that as like parts of my personality. Right. I'm interested in a lot of things. I love exploring different topics. Um, and yeah, like I lose my keys three times a week, whatever, maybe everyone does that. Um, and so it's hard to kind of separate that. I'm like, Oh, maybe everybody. Do you have a tile on your keys? A tile? Yeah. No. Oh, is that one of those tracking things? Uh No, but I need one. Uh I need one. But then I'm like, Oh, but I just suck. And I just need to use the hook by the door. And why can't I just do this? You know? So when I, so I have a tile on a bunch of stuff and I, Uh uh-huh. The only reason I got one was because I gave my dad uh, for Father's Day a couple of years ago a pack of four and I wanted to be able to like help him with it. And he there was one he didn't need. So I was like, how about I'll take that one and then I'll learn how to use it and then I can teach you how to do it when you have a question. Oh, and then amazing. I was like, within like the first couple of days, I had already used it like once or twice. And I was like why haven't I had this all along? And I went out and bought a four pack for myself. And I say, can you put them one in each shoe and one on your wallet and maybe one on your kid? I don't know. I mean, so I I have, I have one on each set of of keys. Uh, Now mind you, my one uh, that are my car keys, the battery just recently died. So we need to replace those. I actually have one in my car for when I can't remember where I parked. Um, so at least we can tell you when it was last like tracked. I have one on the Apple remote, which gets lost at least oh, once a day. The, that's not, you know what? That's not your fault. The Apple remote is as big <laughs> as like a piece of gum. I mean, it's kind of ridiculous. We actually just switched to Roku and I swear 75% of that decision was based on the remote size. <laughs> and, and I have one that I ha- keep in my work bag. Okay, so now this is and it's so funny because and I think this is something with ADHD that we do is we struggle with this whole thing of like, I shouldn't need these tools. I just need to be better. I just need to try harder. Why can't I do this? So anyway, so that goes back to like what you were talking about, what led me to this diagnosis, because, you know, some of these things I'm like, well, maybe this is just how everybody operates and I'm just not doing the best I could be doing. Right. Um, and the funny thing is, is it a web comic led me to the diagnosis and similarly enough, actually that's a web comic. Well, um, ADHD alien. Okay. But also when I had like, I don't know, maybe it was like my first or second, like serious depressive episode when I realized like, Oh my God, this is what depression is. This is that thing they talk about. Do you remember, um, Allie Brosh's web comic hyperbole and a half? I don't know if I'm you remember sure. her, her drawings are like, um, like Microsoft Paint, and she has like the meme, like something, all the things comes from that. Like, anyway, I'm sure your listeners will, will remember Ali Brosh and hyperbole and a half anyway. So, and she has, um, she deals with depression and she wrote a web comic in two parts. One came out like the year afterwards where she kind of chronicles her, um, experience with depression and what that looks like. And she's hilarious. And her illustrations are so simple, but so profound and funny. And so when I went through that, um, that comic, I think it was like adventures in depression. And it was just so relatable. I was like, Oh, shit, like, this is that and this, um, 
this makes so much sense. Um, so she's, that was great. And then I think her, her second one came out maybe, yeah, like a year later or so. And, um, and it was even, it was even greater. Um, but anyway, so that, that's what kind of led me to realize that. And then the ADHD alien comic, I think my friend might've sent it to me like as a screenshot, but it was about, um, ADHD and, um, cycles of anxiety and depression. I'll try to find it and send it to you. But I was like, yeah, we can huh, post it on the show notes. Yeah, great. totally. I was like, oh, huh. And then as that was maybe like November last year or something. And then I was on like this kick of like self-help like books and podcasts and things. Cause in part of this, like being medicated for bipolar, which has marked a good chunk of my life. Well, maybe not, but when you're in your twenties, like everything seems like a lot longer. How old, um, are, you, how old are you? I'm 33. Okay. So the timeline would be probably started having a lot of bipolar symptoms, maybe 20, 21 years old, being medicated at 20, 28, 20, yeah, 28 or 29. Um, anyway, so oh, what was I saying? Mm-mm. I know, right? <laughs> what? What were we? <laughs> it's gone. I, I, I was distracted looking looking up hyperbole and a half on online while you we were talking. <laughs> oh, good. Yeah. Um, <laughs> um, <laughs> Right. Okay. So in this whole, you know, being medicated and then the struggle of like trying to figure out who I am, like, what is the truth of me? Because I'm so used to being marked by these extremes. Like I know the depression, me being like a worthless piece of crap who's Mm. capable of nothing. I know that's not true. I also know that I'm not capable of everything and I'm not the most amazing human being on the planet that hypomania would tell me. Um, I know that's not true either. So like, what is that middle ground? Um, And so I, oh my gosh, last three years, it's like, I would listen to like, audio books like, um, oh, Jen Sincero's like, you are a badass and you are a badass at making money. I love her. I had listened to like a book by Mel Robbins, who's like a motivational speaker. Mm -hmm. And then I happened to like look her up on social media or something. And then she had this clip where she was talking about her late life ADHD diagnosis and talking about how it's so hard to pick up in women and young women, especially just looks so different. Um, and how, once you kind of find that missing puzzle piece, all of these things click and you realize that, well, first of all, a lot of different things that you wouldn't expect that fall under ADHD, or at least can be common symptoms of ADHD, all fall fall into this umbrella of something you might have. Um, And so when I saw that, that plus the ADHD alien comic, I was like, you know what? I think this is a missing part for me. So then I happened to have um, a check-in appointment with my psychiatrist in January. And I was talking to him about how I was like, um, still dealing with anxiety and that I had all these symptoms that I thought could be ADHD. And he was just like, oh yeah, well that wouldn't surprise me because, you know, like the statistics Dr. Olivardia talked about, it's a very common comorbidity. Um, And so he's like, well, we could treat the anxiety and see if that kind of helps with the ADHD symptoms. We could treat the ADHD and see if maybe that helps with the anxiety. Um, And so I had like a a month or two on, um, on ADHD medication, but then the pandemic hit. So like, I feel like I haven't been able to have a baseline of my normal life to kind of see if this is working. But I mean, you have seven months of like, completely different life where there's some room for self-exploration. So we're kind of, we're seeing what's going on. I'm so just struck and kind of just dumbfounded by the fact that like, we're probably maybe hopefully around the halfway point of this pandemic. I mean, maybe Maybe. I, I wasn't trying to be like a pessimist from the beginning, but like, I remember when for me, the date was like March 13th, March 13th and March, um, like 16th were the the dates for me because everyone has like that what was that date where it really changed for you um uh my the arts organization that I work for was supposed to have their annual gala on March 13th which is a Friday and that was the last day of school for my kindergartner before um spring break started and I remember the decision that we could, well we canceled the gala like the day before because that's when things were really starting to look like they were going up 
Uh huh. And we sent everybody, you know, they sent everyone home for spring break. And I think the um, the district made a decision like we're going to make it a two week spring break so we can get this under control. Isn't that the most hilarious thing to look back on now? Like we thought we were going to get this under control in two weeks. OK. And then they said, well, we're going to keep school out till April 23rd and then we'll reevaluate, you know, and blah, blah, blah. I'm like, this is not going to get better this spring or summer. And we know it's going to get worse in the fall and winter. So why are we kidding ourselves? Um, and I live in Missouri. So, you know, there's a lot of people who don't take things too seriously. St. Louis is more or less a nice little bubble of um, common sense and, um, you know, believing in science and stuff like that, that not, I'm sorry, I'm apologizing. I have to apologize for the rest of Missouri. I hope nobody listens to your podcast and is offended. Um, but yeah, so, but things are open. I mean, our case levels are going up now. They're way more than they were in the spring, but we're doing stuff. We're out there, we're shopping, we're going to bars, apparently we're doing this and that. Um, once again, this is not what we were talking about, but here we are. Oh yeah. The pandemic life, not looking well, like how it normally does. But so when we to, to, to try to tie this together, you know, you're, <laughs> you had this sort of identity as a person with bipolar disorder and then uh, added uh, an ADHD diagnosis that you're kind of trying to then make sense of these new, this kind of new layer of your identity. And you're trying to figure that out. But then you're like, how do I even know what is normal? Because the world's turned upside down and is right. on fire, literally. Um, and, we, you know, it's and it, it is it's it's I think everyone is um, we're all exhausted. I mean, we're, we're recording this in the middle of October, um, you know, and, uh, you know, we're leading experts are right now saying maybe hopefully in the spring of 2021, we'll have a, a, a vaccine, you know? So it's, yeah, it's kind I mean, of this is, this is the new normal for now. And, um, just kind of rolling with it, seeing what happens. I trust that after this is over, I will have time to, I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> Whatever real life looks like, then maybe then I'll be able to to figure things out. Because um, it's interesting. I really did develop a lot, a set of pretty good tools before last year working with um, there's a network of like other women, small business owners in St. Louis, and they have someone who works with them who's like a life coach and small business coach. And I learned so much from her in these like workshops and things on time management and organization and this and that. So I feel like I'm and that plus medication, like I feel like I'm maybe ready for real life. Right. But who even knows? So you were prescribed ADHD medication. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And what, what are you, could I ask what you're taking? Um, yeah, it's, um, I can't pronounce the generic, but <laughs> the brand name is Focalin. Okay. It's like De Dexmeth. The I think. Yes, yeah. that one, that one. And I don't know, um, and I haven't had enough time to really to see with the pandemic, not really knowing what regular normal life looks like. But I will say that um before everything changed, one thing I really noticed was um, I mean, usually I have, I don't like to use the metaphor of like 20 tabs opening open in my head at once, but definitely like 20 channels of imagining where a situation could end up, if that makes sense, like mm -hmm. a constant. Um, so it's almost like a, a tree that the branches out, right? You're at the base and you're like, if I do this, this could happen. And that branches out to these possibilities and like that, that completely full brain of, of thoughts, um, I think contributed a lot to the anxiety that I was feeling because every little twig on that tree has a worry attached to it yeah. probably or a problem. Um, and I found that the medication did kind of quiet it, it pruned the branches. This is great. This is a metaphor I'm making up on the fly. And I, I think it. it works actually. Yeah. Um, yeah. So you can prune a cr couple of branches off of there and focus maybe on a, on a few key branches. Then suddenly all these other things kind of quiet down a little bit. Um, and you can actually, I guess that's what focus is, right? <laughs> that elusive thing people talk about. Um, that doesn't mean every day is easy. I mean, there's so many struggles and I don't know, I might play around with that. It might not be the right fit. I guess I got lucky with the bipolar medication. So now I'm like, and then I was prescribed this and I'm fixed. Um, so I'm sure I'll, I'll play around with that a little bit, but there, you know, 
there are other parts of it that I feel like might be better treated with other kinds of tools than medication. Not, I'm not saying medication isn't good. I'm just saying I wonder for me specifically, like if there's other things that that might help my specific things like counseling and um, stuff like that. Well, and, and, and I think too, it, looking at um, when, uh, you know, cause ADHD is not a skill deficit, right? Like we may, it's right. Right. May come, like when people learn that they have uh, ADHD, they may c- kind of start with realizing that there is a skill deficit that was sort of a result of having the ADHD But then when you really get to what's really challenging about ADHD is you then learn the skills and still realize you're having a hard time performing the things you now know to do. And so Mm -hmm. when 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 I hear people say, oh, I don't really want to do medication, I'll just try, you know, I'll try different tools and strategies. I'll just drink more, more water and go to yoga, eat vegetables. Right. And water yoga and vegetables are great so good so good for you for sure but when we're dealing with issues of the brain you know it's um medication when you can tolerate it is one of the most effective parts of an adhd uh treatment plan you know i always feel so sad for people who who they just can't like their body can't tolerate the medication like they try it Mm -hmm. and, and whether the anxiety is way too high or they turns into right. the Hulk. Uh, oh my know, but- gosh, yeah. And I will say that the version I'm on is the like extended time release thing. Um, so often in the beginning, like I take try to <laughs> try to take it in the morning hours, obviously, because I don't want to be up all night. Yeah. Um, there is like kind of a jolt in the morning, which is a little uncomfortable. I feel a little fluttery, a little like kind of too much, but that's usually also because maybe I had two cup of cups of coffee and didn't have breakfast yet. So definitely more to that high likelihood Um, of that. Right. (laughs) So, but then one thing I really noticed was that like, I was able to like, like be at a consistent level of functioning all day. Um, Whereas I feel like if I start the day and I have so much going on and all of the things in my head and everything that I have to keep track of. Um, and if you are a mom and a small business owner in a pandemic, you know what I'm talking about? Um, so many things, so much brain work that by like three or four o'clock, I'm, I can, I'm done, you know, I can't function. And then I'm reaching for coffee at four and just to get myself through the kid's bedtime. And then, um, it's not healthy. So then I'm like, well, is it just because I'm on a time release um, drug that's essentially like related to an amphetamine? You know, well, is it? It's is it that family of. Well, yeah, they're amphetamines, but it doesn't mean that it's, it's a stimulant. It's a, it's a central it's a nervous stimulant. system. So it's stimulant. like, well, maybe I'm just getting through the day because there's a stimulant keeping, you know, so it's like, but, or maybe that's just, you know. Um, but I really think a lot of that has to do with just the exhaustion that the mental workload leaves you with. Do you take breaks? I think. Huh? Do you take breaks, breaks when you're working? I'm, I'm sorry. Can what? What's the what's the break, Eric? The, the break is the thing. That, the thing. The break is the thing we're going to do right now. We're going to take a quick break. Oh, great! And uh, and we will be right back. Support for ADHD Rewired comes from patrons who support us over on Patreon. Add free episodes for our patrons who give $5 a month or more are now here. If you want to get ad free episodes on your podcast player, then go to ADHDrewired.com slash patron feed. If you're a patron only to be logged in, then click on my membership and click ACAST. That's my membership and click ACAST. This should show you how to add the feed to your favorite podcast app. Unless your favorite podcast app is Spotify, talk to Spotify. It's not my issue. Um, or I wish we can get it on there, but uh, that's Spotify. So anyways, um, now that I just said Spotify five times, uh, maybe I can get some advertising money from uh, from them. But um, how about from you? Uh, you can support us on uh, Patreon. Uh, there are also, we do our monthly coaching calls for patrons at the $25 a month level. And we are also using this private podcast feed through ACAST. So you can get the recordings of those monthly coaching calls if you are a patron at the $10 a month level. So those will drop just like a podcast you're listening to right now. 
So I do want to thank all of our patrons who support us at every level. I really, really do appreciate everyone's support. And remember, those patrons who gave it $25 a month or more can join me on the fourth Tuesday of every month for a group coaching call on Zoom. We do that at 1 p.m. Pacific, 4 p.m. Eastern. All of our $25 a month levels can join me every fourth Tuesday of the month. The next one is February 23rd, 1 p.m. Pacific, 4 p.m. Eastern. You can support ADHD Rewired even if you don't care about these perks. Maybe you get so much value out of the podcast and the community and you want to say thank you with a monthly financial contribution. Then go to ADHDRewired.com slash patron and you can show that you value this podcast. Thank you for all of you who contribute. The website again is ADHDRewired.com and just click on the Patreon tab at the top of the page. And thanks. And so you know that uh, besides this podcast, besides ADHD Rewired, we also have ADHD Essentials for Parents and Educators hosted by Brendan Mahan. And we also have one hosted by Will Curb called Hacking Your ADHD. And this week's episode on Hacking Your ADHD is all about masquerading as adults. Great title. I love that. Check it out and subscribe at HackingYourADHD.com. Also coming to the ADHD Rewired Podcast Network are the ADHD Friendly Lifestyle with Moira Mabin and ADHD Diversified with MJ Siemens. And even though these podcasts haven't yet dropped, you can meet all our podcasters at each live monthly Q&A on the second Tuesday of the month. Our next live Q&A is Tuesday, February 9th at 10.30 a.m. Pacific, 1.30 p.m. Eastern. To register, go to ADHDRewired.com slash events. We also air the live Q&A on our Facebook page. So don't forget to like our Facebook page to get notified when we go live. We hope to see you there. All right, we are back with Malika Tolford. So let's talk pottery. So that's your business. Oh, okay. Ah, that's, like, ooh, I like this topic. That's a relief. Pottery. Yes, I like this topic. And, and real quick, how much juice you got left in the computer? I have 45%. Oh, we're, we're gold. We're we, beautiful. We got this. We're good. We're, yeah. All right. So you have this this uh, pottery business and I was uh, I was looking on your Etsy page and it's really beautiful stuff. It's, uh, oh, thank you. Where geography meets clay. Yes. Yes. And of course that has, you know, a background that has a, a lot of um, ADHD and bipolar related, like, you know, yeah, I don't know. Talk yeah. about that. Okay. Well, you know, um, I am interested in everything. Um, when I went to college, I studied um, history and art history and anthropology. And um, I don't know if this is an ADHD thing or not. If you're interested in a lot of different things, I had no idea what I actually wanted to do. I just liked the things that I liked and I wanted to study the things I wanted to study. And I had probably about 15 different possible career tracks that I, I thought I might want to follow. Um, but I got to do all the different kinds of things I wanted to do in college and study what I wanted to study and um, dabble in archaeology a little bit. And um, I, but because I, I liked all the things I decided, um, I was about to say impulsively, but no, like, let's be real. I was in a state of hypomania and I was like, you know what? I'm going to, I was, I already knew I was moving to St. Louis because my boyfriend at the time was going to get his MFA at WashU. So we knew we were moving to St. Louis, but then I was like, you know what? I'm going to go to grad school too. I'm going to study geography. I'm going to get my master's of science. Um, I'm going to drive down right now because I told them I was available for an interview on Friday. So I'm just going to go drive down to St. Louis right now and do that, get into the program, start classes that summer. Um, and then I was like, what am I, what am I doing? This isn't where I want to be. Now I'm taking, I'm living in St. Louis. I'm driving 30 miles every day to get to a huge parking lot. It's like a hundred degrees. I'm well, you know that I'm from Chicago. I didn't have a car before I moved to St. Louis. Um, driving, I mean, I like to drive, but I wasn't used to it as being part of my daily life. Um, total culture shock, did not really give myself a lot of time to adjust. And 
um, burnt out, was like, this is not what I wanted to do. And that kind of did also coincide with coming down out of that hypomania and slipping into a depression and being like, I'm just going to withdraw from all the classes and not do this Mm. and then live in my bed for a few months. Um, And then when I kind of started to emerge from that, I'm like, well, I'm in St. Louis. I'm waiting tables. I have no friends. What am I doing with my life? Um, And I was like, well, you know what? Maybe I'm going to go find a clay studio because um, in addition to all the other interests like art and science and history that I was interested in high school, I also spent like every free period I had in the clay studio. I loved clay, but I never like thought of it as something that I would study in college or even pursue as a career. Um, So anyway, I I found I Googled, you know, Clay Studios, St. Louis, like from underneath my covers miserably and found um, this arts organization. I guess I could name it. Why not? It's Craft Alliance um, in St. Louis. And um, and I became kind of like a well member of their Clay Studio and part of that community. Um, I had had a little bit of teaching experience with kids um, from back in high school. And I worked at a like tiny little ceramic studio, um, and taught kids classes. So they were like, do you want to teach summer camp? And I was like, sure. Um, so I taught art classes to kids that summer, did it like pretty much every summer since then started getting to teach adults, um, like around 2015 or something. And, um, and working on my business, I think I came up with like the business and the name, um, pretty soon after I started getting back into clay and the geography thing, um, Eric didn't mention this. Most of my, my work has something to do with place. So maps, street maps, um, things like that are usually the decorative motifs I use in my work. Um, and yeah, so that's what I did off and on because also dealing with, you know, depression and hypomania in and out of the clay studio, in and out of teaching a little bit, but always being able to have my foot in the door in some way and having a place to go back to. Um, And then especially with having kids being able to maybe teach once a week, you know, or, or teach three classes a week or, um, you know, spend weeks where I have all day, every day in the clay studio and then, you know, times when I can't. So it's been a cool career. I've only spent the last couple of years really building the business Uh, made the shift from teaching a little bit less and making and producing a little bit more in the last couple of years. Yeah, this year is like, I I built up so much momentum doing local shows last year. I'm like, this is the year that it's really all gonna blah. Um, I applied to two shows that I was so afraid to apply for because, you know, of rejection sensitivity dysmorphia, which is totally something I I deal with. Um, I got in and then the pandemic hit, but I'm trying to still, I have a really great customer base and online sales have been good. It's hard pivoting. It's hard not being able to, see your customers and know that they get to feel things in their hands um, and all of that. So it's been hard to pivot, but it is what it is. Well, what's been the hardest thing uh, about pivoting um, and, and, you know, factoring in COVID, ADHD, bipolar, like all the things. (laughs) What's been the hardest thing? Um, I think that time, there's not enough time to do everything and balancing everybody else's lives. Um, you know, the kids being in school was an amazing thing for me. Once my youngest started going to daycare when he was two, it was like, oh my gosh, I have time that I, I don't have to fit my work into nap time or other people's schedules or whatever. Um, so I had, you know, like two years of, of that. And that made me able to really establish the business because I had that time. So I don't have that time anymore with the kids home. Um, my husband working from home, it's like, it's impossible. Um, plus my studio is closed. I was still doing most of my production work at Craft Alliance. Um, and so when they had to close their doors, it was like, what am I going to do? I, I borrowed someone's wheel. I was working out of my like scary basement, um, and firing my stuff like around town, dropping my stuff off at friends' porches so that they could fire my stuff. I mean, it was chaotic. Um, we actually just bought a house, Eric. We moved into a house last week. It was wow. crazy. Yeah. So now I'm going to be able to have my and studio. You're, and you're already all unpacked, right? Oh, totally. There's no boxes anywhere. I know where everything is because I'm just super organized like that. Um, but, but yeah, things are kind of coming together. 
um, my oldest actually went back to school in person, which if you asked me like last month, I'd be like, that's insane. No one should be going back to school. And I also do feel that way. And I know it's not going to be forever. I'm sure we're all going to be going back into some kind of isolation in the next couple of months. But I was like, yes, yes, please go to school. Please go to school. Just tighten our little family isolation bubble bubble and, um, and see what happens. So it's been interesting just being me and my husband and my four-year-old at home. Um, it still has its challenges, but I feel like we're going to get into a better routine. And the fact that you, on top of all of this, you just moved, which <laughs> moving is, and in, in, in from my, oh my life God. experience, like one of the worst things. Like It's I, awful. We, we started looking for a house in the spring and the market was insane. And we couldn't, we couldn't get a house if we, like, we were trying really hard and couldn't find one. Mediocre houses that we weren't crazy about were selling for $20,000 over asking, which in St. Louis real estate is a lot, by the way, in case you're listening um, from like a real city. Just kidding. I love St. Louis. Um, yeah. So it was really, really hard. And we, we gave up, we stopped. And then I was still peeking at the listings and we saw this little house and I was like, okay, I think maybe this is the one. And so and it, it happened fast. It was like Labor Day weekend that we saw the house, put an offer on it. It was accepted. And it was a whirlwind. It was like a four-week escrow. And we've lived here for a week. Wow. Um, long story short, like there is kind of a foundation being laid right now. I think that things will get easier. The pandemic will eventually be over. Eventually I'll have two kids in school and I'll have my studio at home, which means that hopefully life will be easier. I hope. I mean, you know, we'll see. I mean, I, what, what I, what I think we should not say is that it can't oh. get much worse, right? Oh, like, don't say that. I, Why would you even say that out loud? Oh my gosh. Yeah. Don't do that. Because I, I've said that a couple of times earlier in the year and I was like, nope, I, uh, I'll eat those words and oh uh, my I will never say those things again. Oh yeah. Like I, I don't even want to know how, what kind of worse it could possibly get. Did you know, um, I don't know if you knew this, but we're also in an election year. <laughs> Um, so that adds, that adds. By the time this comes out, the election will probably hopefully be over and decided. God. (sighs) Deep sigh. Deep sigh. Um, yeah. I wanted to mention, I'm sorry, maybe you had a question to ask next. No, I was just, you know. Don't come out of that. (laughs) Don't, don't think about the election right now. Um, come back. So I wanted to to mention something about just like the interesting things that come with learning about this diagnosis is there were all these little things that I would never have guessed maybe were related to ADHD, yeah. like other things that I deal with and then have learned a lot about. So one of them is, and I don't know, I'm sure a lot of your listeners probably deal with this, but body focused repetitive behaviors, um, which I learned was a thing by like probably Googling, does everybody pick at their cuticles so much to the point where their fingers are scarred and they can't stop? Um, and actually funny enough, and I never put this together until a few months ago, but I think I read an article by Dr. Olivardia about that. Cause I think he works a lot with, um, like body image issues mm-hmm. or body, body you know, dysmorphic disorder. Yeah. 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 So when I found out a, that, okay, that's a thing. Right. But then it was even months after I got the ADHD diagnosis that I read an article that was like, this is a very, you know, common link. There's like a dopamine effect. Right. Um, and I always thought, well, I don't know what I always thought that I'm just a weirdo who like has to pick at their skin, not to mention as a potter, like my hands are always dry. There's all, oh, it's man. awful. Yeah. So that was something I learned that that was linked. I haven't solved that problem yet, but at least I know, Oh, maybe that's, that's a thing. Um, we talked a little bit about rejection sensitivity dysphoria, but that is also something that I've dealt with. Um, and that I think coupled with, um, dealing with the bipolar is that I have all these different versions of myself, like being completely amazing and the best at everything. And why wouldn't I get to do anything that I ever wanted? The world is open to me to like, I'm a piece of shit and I can't do anything. And why would anybody like, you know, want anything from me or want to deal with me at all? Um, And so that kind of finding that middle ground of like, what is the truth of me and um, getting over that, 
trying to build confidence where I was chemically given a false confidence before and trying to figure that out has been really interesting. So yeah, um, that's something to deal with. And most recently, I realized that I think I have a bit of an audio processing disorder. Ironic that we had so many audio issues at the beginning of this. Um, but all these things, like these little parts of my personality that you think are like glitches or you just kind of suck in this little way or you have you know, a defect. I was never hard on myself about it, but I remember one time my best friend was in town who I grew up with and my husband and I um, were hosting her at our house and we were like all cooking in the kitchen or something. And I don't know what we were talking about, but it came up. The fact that I am always like, what? When someone says anything came up and they're like, oh my God, yeah, you say what? Way too much all the time. It's like some sort of weird tick. And I got really. After you say what, do you then realize what the person said? Oh, absolutely. And that was another funny thing is I saw a meme that like kind of uh, laid that out in a really funny way. And I'm like, I'm like, oh, okay, is this just like, it's funny. I feel like everyone's um, like self diagnoses or like revelations to seek a diagnosis come from like random web comics and memes they see on the internet. Um, but yeah, so it's like, yeah, I, I use subtitles when I watch anything. My son does that. And he also, yeah. and he also uses the, the, um, what are the, the, the subtitles for people who are visually impaired that were like, oh, yeah. and like so-and-so walking into this yes. room. It's so fascinating. So that, and the, like, you know, my husband can walk by and tell me something words. Like I understand that he's speaking, <laughs> but then well then I'm like what so, um, and so then you can start saying it again mm -hmm. and I'm like no, no no yeah I heard you like it just took you know that and like being really sensitive to sound in ways that I don't notice like someone could be right next to me talking but there's like a buzz from an electronic thing on the other side of the room that I'm like get totally distracted and irritated by I'll tell you that uh um if because what you're describing I could have said all of those same words for myself uh -huh. um the Bose noise canceling headphones have been one of the best <gasps> tools for for that because you can actually wear them all day long though which is like most headphones like after a while like they hurt on your head uh-huh they're comfy yeah i can wear these for all day and they will block out the the sounds of a four and six year old boy like whining or fighting or what some, that's the other problem is i swear what? there's like this extra audio sensitivity built into motherhood because you're like biologically programmed to hear every single possible like bad thing that could be happening um so yeah that's that's a hard thing um and then do you have do you find yourself having trouble this is recently because i really haven't been going out and about during the pandemic but now i find that if i'm at a store or or working with someone face to face in some way um, the mask thing is actually really difficult for me. And it's not just because people are muffled, but I think I need, I require a visual cue of seeing like someone's yeah. mouth start to move. Yeah. And it's not like I'm necessarily lip reading, but I need that because I swear if someone starts talking to me, I'm not going to hear them or understand what they're saying until my brain is like, this person is using words at you. Please process this now so you can reply. Do you, do you think that a, uh, a solution to this could be uh, just we all carry like a hand puppet with us? Like, and so when we're talking, we just like use the hand puppet to... um. Uh, Use, I think that mouth. that is a great solution and it won't be creepy at all. You should definitely look into this. We will, uh, we'll, we'll get on that. Yeah. So if people want to find uh, um, art that you can actually buy and not just hand puppets, but pottery, um, <laughs> tell people where they can find that. And, uh, and if there's any kind of final thoughts you want to share um, oh, for, sure. for someone with ADHD who is wondering if they have, they might have bipolar disorder. Oh, yeah, that's such a good question. Um, I'm going to answer that one first because yes. I think that's more important than like a plug, even though the whole reason I'm doing this interview is just to be able to do the plug, right? <laughs> um, just sharing my life story for the um, for the business. No, um, it's so weird for me to think about it that way because my diagnosis was the other way around, right? I got the bipolar, which was way louder um, than the ADHD, got that under control, and then the ADHD symptoms kind of start to emerge and reveal themselves. So for somebody with ADHD who thinks that they might have a bipolar illness, I would say 
once again, not a clinician, and this is like totally a hypothesis, but I would imagine that, you know, an ADHD person without um, a comorbid diagnosis does have those um, like, you know, hyper focus, maybe days or, or weeks where they're really like buzzing and have a lot of things going on and whatever. But I would say that like, you know, hypomania looks very different than that. We already talked about the physical thing, like a lack of a need for eating or sleeping or whatever, but also beyond just like being really excited about things and maybe like, um, I don't know, developing a new this or that, or I don't know what all the things people, you know, deal with, with ADHD in terms of like productivity, right? High productivity. We go through phases of that, right? Mm -hmm. Hypomania is more than high productivity. It's like knowing that you could do it all. I want to give you guys an example because we talked about the difference between mania and hypomania, right? So mania might be like, I don't know, stealing cars or burning things down. Once again, I'm taking a lot of this from like weird media portrayals of the illness. Um, but hypomania is like, for example, um, one fall, I decided to um, quit my restaurant job and gather a bunch of people like with me to open a restaurant. We we're going to open a restaurant together. I was getting in rooms with funders and um, real estate developers, like really going to go for it and do this. Um, developing menus with like a chef that somehow I was able to like bring into my circle and make this happen with. And then I also at the same time decided to take five courses at the community college because I thought that maybe I would um, go back to school to get my art education certification. Um, I, I started writing for that community college's newspaper. I got a free trip to New Orleans to go to like the annual like student journalism convention. Um, and I also decided um, that we should not wait, but we should like start having kids now. That was like all one month. Oh my God. Right? <laughs> So that's what, for me, that's what hypomania looks wow. like. And for other people who are used to knowing that I'm a person who likes doing things, is interested in lots of different things, it's kind of hard to recognize. I mean, even with for the person that I lived with, you know, it's just like, wow, she's doing an awful lot of things right now, but okay. And of course, all of those fizzled out and dissolved and I dropped those classes and I, I found another job like doing wine sales, which was like very you know, a lot easier. Obviously I was still pregnant. So there's that, but, um, but all the rest of that kind of trickles away. Um, so that's, so, so for somebody that has ADHD, who's thinking, what if this could be bipolar? Well, do you have depressive episodes that, I mean, you could look this up, right? Like that last a specific amount of time, or you have them a certain amount of times a year, or your energy and productivity crosses a line into delusion, I would say, um, those might be symptoms of a bipolar disorder. Um, yeah, but like, I, I, I don't know if I'm lucky that it went the other way, but I think, I think that bipolar was just so much louder for me. Um, and of course that's a, an, um, a disorder that kind of develops. I mean, I think, I mean, you can, you can have a bipolar diagnosis as a child, but I think that's something that usually comes out early twenties. So you might have a version of yourself from your childhood or, or teenage years, which maybe look different. So I look back and I think, OK, what were all of my ADHD symptoms, which were clearly there? Um, what did that look like before the bipolar kind of developed? I forget what your question was. It was, uh, well, you, I think you answered it very, very thoroughly. <laughs> okay, okay. And then the final question is, as we uh, bring this conversation to a close, um, Tell people where they can find your pottery. Oh, sure. Um, okay, so my business is called Place Value Pottery. And I, um, you can find me at placevaluepottery.com. That'll link you to my Etsy shop for shopping. And um, yeah, I, put, I do a lot of custom work. So if you like maps, if you like the places that are important to you, um, I put maps on things, basically. So if that appeals to any of you guys, um, find me. Awesome. You can also find me on Instagram because that's where I feel like I'm most active. So that's Place Value Pottery. Awesome. Yeah. Well, yeah. thank you so much for sharing your story. Um, and uh, and I wish you the, the very best with, with everything. It's uh, what what a what a world we are living in. What this a is, time uh, to be alive. Right, yeah. What a time. Yeah. Well, thank you for letting me share my story because it's not 
every, I mean, I hope that it resonates with someone. Right? I hope that someone hears it and is like, oh, um, because you don't get to talk to a lot of people who are experiencing, you know, similar things as you, which is why podcasts are awesome. And you're awesome. Thank you so much. Thank you. This is Eric Tivers. Thank you for listening and congratulations for making it to the end. ADHD Rewired is more than just a podcast. We are a community focused on learning, growing, and connection. The website is ADHDrewired.com. You can find summaries and additional resources for each episode. You can apply to our free and secret Facebook community. You can learn more about ADHD Rewired's intensive online video-based coaching and accountability groups and sign up for my email newsletter to get exclusive content you won't get anywhere else. It's all at ADHDrewired.com. While you're there, click the Patreon button. If you're a regular listener and you're still listening to my voice, consider making a monthly contribution by becoming a patron through our Patreon page. If you are able to financially support my work, it would mean a lot. This show is free to listeners, but it is not free to produce. And patrons get really cool perks. You can follow me on Twitter at Eric Tivers. You can like our Facebook page at facebook.com slash ADHD Rewired. If you're a coach, therapist, or related professional, connect with me on LinkedIn at linkedin.com slash Eric Tivers. You can also subscribe to ADHD Rewired on YouTube. And you can subscribe to ADHD Rewired on YouTube and see select interviews and some other videos I've posted. Podcasts change lives. You can make a difference in someone's life by spreading the word about this podcast. Mention it in your online communities on Facebook, Twitter, Reddit, or wherever you hang out online. And be sure to share it with your friends and your family and your clients, as well as your coaches, therapists, and doctors. And if you're a coach, therapist, doctor, or ADHD support group leader, and you would like a pack of podcast postcards to hand out, you can request those at my website, ADHDrewired.com. And if you're a member of Chad or any other ADHD support group, please be sure to tell them about this podcast. You can even show them how to download it on their phone. You know, you might be the person that turns somebody on to a podcast for the very first time. And if you really love this episode, please consider hitting share on your podcast player. I'm only one person and I count on you to help me spread the message. One of the biggest things that you can do to support this podcast and to help other people discover it is to leave an honest rating and review on Apple Podcasts, uh, Stitcher, or any other podcast app that accepts ratings and reviews. And don't forget to hit subscribe on this podcast on your podcast app so new episodes are automatically pushed to your favorite podcast app. Looking for more ways to listen and learn? Get a free audiobook and a 30-day free trial at audibletrial.com slash ADHD Rewired. Not sure where to start? In no particular order. Check out Atomic Habits by James Clear, The Body Keeps Score by Bessel van der Kolk, 10% Happier, and Meditation for Fidgety Skeptics. These are both by Dan Harris. Change Your Questions and Change Your Life by Marilee G. Adams. The One Thing by Gary Keller and Jay Papasan. Procrastinate on Purpose by Rory Vaden. The Four Tendencies by Gretchen Rubin. Do you have trouble asking for help? Listen to The Art of Asking by Amanda Palmer. It's one of the best produced audiobooks I've ever heard. If you're looking for something a little bit more, say, magical, I unexpectedly fell in love with the Harry Potter series. And I don't usually listen to those kinds of books. And I loved it. And of course, if you haven't yet boarded the Brene Brown bus yet, check out Brene Brown's books, starting with The Gifts of Imperfection, Daring Greatly, Rising Strong, The Power of Vulnerability. And if you're an entrepreneur or a leader in any capacity, check out her 2018 book, Dare to Lead. And Brene still is my most wanted guest. So if you know Brene, you would be so kind to make that connection for me. I would be really, really grateful. You know who else I would like to have on the show? You. Click the podcast tab at ADHDrewired.com and then click the Be a Guest button at the top of that page and schedule a 15-minute pre-interview. This is Eric Tivers reminding you to keep learning, keep growing, and keep connecting. Self-care is not selfish, and no matter what gets done or doesn't get done, at the end of the day, you are still enough. And no matter how hard it feels, we can do 
are things. Thanks for listening. I'll catch you next week.